Settle down. You That's guys right. are both going to be in the same arena tonight. That would be the Garden. So let's discuss. King James will get to see the Zen Master in person after Phil Jackson made disparaging comments toward LeBron's business associates, calling them his posse. And Phil, he's not backing down. Lisa Leslie asked Jackson if he'd like to take back what he said about LeBron James on CBS Sports Network. Here's what he said. I violated one of those tenets of our thing. And the obvious thing is the word itself carries connotation. And I just don't understand that part of it, the word. So I guess word choice could be something I could regret. But yeah, talking about other team's players, that's out of the box. Leslie then asked Jackson if he wanted to meet with James and clear things up. No, it's water under the bridge. I don't think there was anybody hurt or harmed in this situation. I think LeBron's friend obviously had an issue with it, so we just let it go. It's not enough to talk about it. Stephen A., you think LeBron should forgive Phil? Uh, well, first of all, I think that anybody, you know, I think that the, the world is full of second chances. I mean, that's what America's supposed to be about. Um, and I definitely think that it's something uh, that, that LeBron James should forgive him for. That doesn't mean you have to talk about it. That doesn't mean that you have to sit down and have dinner together or sing kumbaya to one another. Make no mistake about it. But at the same time, I mean, listen, he's a human being and everybody's entitled to make mistakes, make errors in judgment and go from there. I do think it's important to highlight this point, Max. And I was talking to my man, uh, uh, Brandon Tierney. He and I go back a long ways. You remember my brother BT. right here, Max. Yeah, of course. And, and, and you know, yeah, that's right, the one and only BT. And we were talking about this uh, yesterday because obviously it was something that, you know, he, along with a lot of white individuals who happen to be friends of mine and I know very well, you know, they felt like LeBron James basically took, and him and his crew essentially took uh, uh, just a harmless mistake um, and, and just elevated it to astronomical proportions. And, you know, thinking about it from that perspective, thinking about the world that we're living in, how PC everybody believes it should become, and, and it has become to some degree when real issues of race come up and you turn something like this into a race-related issue, it's something that they find incredibly offensive. And I think that that's something uh, that I owe it to them and many, many others, particularly my white contemporaries, to point out that that's a valid argument if you were making it about anybody else. Uh, certainly when it came to Phil Jackson, you're not making the argument that Phil Jackson is racist or in any way. Phil Jackson's history, his left liberal leaning, you know, mentality uh, to some degree, his actions throughout decades clearly show that there's nothing about racist or racism that should have anything to do with Phil Jackson. The problem, however, is that Phil Jackson is a cerebral individual. Uh, he's very, very slick with his word, words and his verbiage, and he usually knows what he's doing. So it's hard to believe that he made a mistake in saying what he said. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with race, but what it did, what it did have something to do with were taking those individuals that are friends of LeBron James and not recognizing who they are and what they bring to the table as intelligent, young, accomplished individuals that LeBron assisted on a come up and basically reducing them to an entourage or a posse or anything like that. You're sort of quelling or diminishing or dissipating their level of accomplishment. And you're basically associating with them with street individuals who are where they are just because LeBron James is their friend. A. And that's why they took it the way that they took it. And that's not racist or racism, but at the same time, it's something that Phil Jackson should have known better than because he deals with enough African-Americans. He understands enough about them to know how that would have been interpreted. And he was wrong. To well, do Stephen, so. a., as you were describing it, you said his crew. I think Phil Jackson originally was just using posse with crew interchangeably and he's outdated or wasn't sensitive enough to it. And LeBron pointed it out. And OK, that could be a teaching moment about assumptions that people make about groups of people, et cetera, or even maybe about sure. being a, a extra sensitive toward groups of people mm -hmm. um, based on various things. But I, I want to get a little bit more into what I think is really going on here. And I don't think it's about race. Sure. Phil Jackson. Neither is do pe I. People talk about, you know, the Eastern philosophy of it all with Phil Jackson. And this is very Sun Tzu of him. Undermine everything that is good in the land of your enemy, 
right? That's always been Phil Jackson. He tries to undermine everything that's good in the land of his enemy. So that in 2011, when he thought his Lakers might make it to the finals again, they've been to three straight, and he knew what the rising power was in Miami with LeBron James and the Heat and the big three, and Spolstra came out and said that when there was talk about maybe Pat Riley replacing him as coach, there were guys crying in the locker room. Phil Jackson said, this is the NBA, no boys allowed. He was saying he was throwing shade at the team that he thought he would have to undermine. And who's that team now? If you're any team competing in the NBA, particularly in the East, that's LeBron James. Really, wherever LeBron James is, he was in Miami. Now it's Cleveland, the defending champions. And so Phil was throwing shade. And generally what happens when he does that is all the stuff that splatters is left for the person to whom he threw the shade they have to deal with it, not Phil. LeBron James here is showing how mature he is. He's like the final stage of Jedi Master or like uh, Bruce Leroy in, in The Last Dragon and, and Phil Jackson is shown off and now well, LeBron's got that glow because LeBron puts up a mirror just to flex it, says, oh, posse, that's an interesting word. That's an interesting choice. Why did he say that? And now it's all back on well, Phil and Phil's got to deal with it, so why should LeBron forgive him? LeBron's like, no, I'm done with it. It's good. You can deal with Phil Jackson about it. He out Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson. That's amazing. Yeah, but at the same time, I think that you, I, I don't think you're looking at it correctly, if I may say so. I think there's a couple of things that you need to take into consideration. And let me put on my insider hat here, Max, mm -hmm. uh, just, to, just to be fair. Just to be fair. Let's understand that Phil with that little soliloquy with the posse word implemented the whole thing about LeBron James supposedly, you know, the team, you know, not being ready to go and Eric Spolstra calling Pat Riley and, you know, what is there to do here? Phil gave the impression that there was some inside information that he was letting out there about LeBron James essentially coming across as a prima donna and, 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 and forcing Eric Spolster to take a position, bringing up Pat Riley, and then inserting his boys into the equation. And when you do that, coupled with what you were saying about LeBron, you're essentially giving the impression, typical young dude in the NBA, with his quote-unquote posse, this is how they act, this is what they require. Now, that doesn't mean that Phil Jackson said anything because they were black. But Phil Jackson was saying something about a culture. He was saying something about his perception of that culture. He was giving an indication of what individuals like himself but and Phil, the Pat Rollins of the a. world have to deal with. And LeBron James was challenging the accuracy of right, it because as Phil, well as Maverick because, and Rich Paul and those guys. Because LeBron James is an exception to the rule in almost every way. He's amazing. And even his organization, he's a CEO, even his organization is amazing when you consider there are guys from high school, from his his high school team who aren't just hangers on obviously they're key pieces in his business and they have done extraordinary things in business that's not the story of many or even most or even you know I mean it's very few and so LeBron is the exception Phil Jackson generalizes there and LeBron saying time out that's not me I don't know who you're generalizing about I also don't think that's about race though it could be interpreted that way but how it certainly can be interpreted under the umbrella of Phil throwing shade, undermining the other, right? He points, where's the threat? It's them, they're the dominant team. I'm gonna just undermine them, undermine everything that is good in the land of your enemy. And, and LeBron James deflected which, which ultimately, it and did it back to Phil better than Phil did it to him using Phil's own words to yeah. hang him. But I got news for you. You're not hurting Phil by bringing up race because everybody knows that racism and racist don't go with Phil Jackson. It doesn't match. You're actually letting him off the hook by bringing up race because that's not what Phil is associated with. He's still talking with. about When it, you Steve get man. into Phil's intent, yeah, yeah, but when you get into Phil as his intent and his agenda, which both you and I just articulated, now you're getting to the nuts and bolts of it. But racism and Phil Jackson, please. But he's got to deal with it. LeBron's washed his hands. Now Phil's got to answer the questions. It's he always the other to. way. He doesn't have to do it. He doesn't have All to right. do that. So the Michael, not with Michael Jordan and Kobe around. He doesn't have to. And, and Shaq, he doesn't have to do that. Everybody knows that's not Phil.
The Cavs are at the Garden tonight. You guys will be there at 8 Eastern. And let's get to uh, Phil's former stomping grounds. That would be the Staples Center. That's where our nightcap is. And two teams that do not like each other. Steph Curry and the Warriors first in the West, taking on Chris Paul and the Clippers for our third. Golden State has won six straight games against L.A. And Doc Rivers knows the Clippers' window is closing. Everybody's window is different. And, and the thing with our team, when you look at us as a total, uh, we are very young, other than Chris. We've had some strange circumstances over the last three years, and some have been in our control. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is you have a nucleus, and then you start seeing what you can put around that group to maybe change that window and make the window bigger. So we are always evaluating that. I think this team uh, has life, and I think we're going to play it up. All right, the window's closing. Stephen A., what do you need to see from the Clippers tonight? Well, I'd like to see them win. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that the Golden State Warriors, we need to see somebody that we can legitimately look at, not just as a roster, but in terms of their production, and say, this team can give them a run for their money. And I'm going to put the onus on the Clippers more so than the San Antonio Spurs, the Oklahoma City Thunder, or anybody else for that matter, because there is a healthy, real, and authentic dislike that both these squads have for one another and like going up against each other due to it. And although Kevin Durant, Klay Thompson, and Steph Curry is a lethal weapon three, if ever there was one, Blake Griffin, Chris Paul, and DeAndre Jordan are nothing to sneeze at. They're Lob City. Take away DeAndre Jordan's free throw shooting, and this team is incredibly formidable. Then when you got my man Jay Boogie, Jamal Crawford, you know Mr. And One himself that I call, you got Raymond Felton coming off the bench, you got Maurice Spates who was in Golden State, he's now with the LA Clippers. You see some of the bodies that they've added to add depth to their roster. You've got Austin Rivers who I like as well. You look at all of these guys, they have the pieces to compete with Golden State. Now I don't think they're better than Golden State, but you know how it is. When competition is competition is stiff, Max, and you want somebody so badly, and that adrenaline is elevated and what have you, then all of a sudden it raises the stakes because the greatness in you, if you got it, comes out. And you respond to the challenge. We see Chris Paul and what he could do. But I'm here to tell you there's an elevated level of play that I've seen on many occasions whenever Chris Paul is going up against Steph Curry because Steph Curry going to get his, but Chris Paul refuses to get squashed and annihilated and embarrassed. I need to see the same thing from Blake Griffin. I need to see the same thing from DeAndre Jordan and Jamal Crawford and the rest of the crew. It is time. And if you're going to lose, go down swinging. That's the kind of thing that we need to see from the Clippers when they're going up against the Golden State Warriors in order for them to take us take the order for us to take them seriously. We were asked before the season started, what's the team best suited to upset the apple cart in the NBA, the eventual finals that we all know is coming, barring catastrophic injury between the Cavs and the Warriors. I picked the Clippers. But I don't actually think the Clippers are going to beat the Warriors. It's kind of like me here at ESPN, Stephen A. Everyone knows that no one can beat me in a debate, but who has the best shot? Okay, I guess Stephen A. Smith. If everything goes right, maybe he can actually, get a debate from Max Kellerman. But actually, you know it's not really going to happen, we're but actually, maybe he has we're the best actually, shot. We're actually, we're, we're actually waiting for you to actually debate now, and show up for me. So when you the, do, let me know. The quest, go ahead. The question is, what are you looking for from the Clippers tonight? And the answer for me is defensive communication. That's what you're looking for. For them to have any chance against the Warriors in the eventual Western Conference Finals, should it be them and the Warriors and not the Spurs, which is very possible, and the Warriors, you have to have crazy good defensive communication. What the Warriors do better than anybody is figure out in the flow of the offense, in the flow of the game, who's hot. They figure that out early and they feed him. See Clay Thompson the other night, right? So what they, you, need, you need crazy good defensive communication and you need to pick up the ball handler, Steph Curry, early. He has infinite range, it spaces the floor extra, not all spacing is created equal. And ideally, you'd like Clay Thompson to not be the guy he was the other night. You want him to be a guy who has to put the ball on the floor and make decisions driving to the basket, which he can do, but not like Steph Curry, obviously. And it makes Klay Thompson lesser than he was the other night. He took like 11 dribbles the other night, I think the stat was. Who was it? That I think it was Haberstro who came up, who, who came up with that stat. 11 dribbles for 60 points, something crazy like that. Klay can't be that. So the Clippers have to 
communicate defensively, loudly, early, and well to have a shot. If they can start demonstrating that they can do that this early in the season, maybe it's an indication that at some point they could actually compete with the Warriors in the Western Conference Finals. That's what I'm looking for tonight. Well, listen, the bottom line is this. Blake Griffin is a star. We won't dispute that. I need him to be a superstar. Kevin Durant is a superstar. Steph Curry is a superstar. Klay Thompson, as far as I'm concerned, is a superstar because of his shooting ability. Let me tell you something right now. You can offset that by attacking with veracity and making sure that Golden State's front line has to contend with you. Blake Griffin was once upon a time box office. Some would say he is still box office. He's a Skywalker. Where is that dude? I know he can play. I'm not asking him to do something. I think he's he having can't a great do. season, I'm Stephen. A. You have to recognize. Yeah, I, I, I'm talking about the Warriors. I'm not talking about the season. I'm talking about against the Warriors. I need him to be that dude because DeAndre Jordan and Chris Paul, they can't do it without Blake Griffin against the Warriors. You're going to win. You're going to even make a series competitive against the Warriors. You want to send a message to the basketball world that this is a team that can legitimately be a threat to the Golden State Warriors in the Western Conference. Blake Griffin has to be a superstar, period.